We're going to read from Genesis 3, verses 1 through 7, then I'll explain why that, I think you'll see why that clip comes into play. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired uh, to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves one cloths. We see three failures in this uh, ancient part of God's word. In fact, there's so much in the first three chapters of Genesis that describe uh, the world we live in today. Three failures. First is failure to recognize the enemy. Failure to recognize the enemy. You could make a good argument that the key line in that movie, Pearl Harbor, was what you saw right at the end when the Japanese commander says, we have achieved surprise. Uh, No kidding. Understatement of the century. Uh, because that was likely the greatest uh, sneak attack ever planned in the history of modern warfare, and it was not noticed. They got in under the radar. Of course, the flip side of that is allowing oneself to be surprised. As I understand it, there were all kinds of chances for U.S. forces to sniff out the coming Japanese attack, but for all kinds of reasons, they failed to do so on all kinds of levels. There was a failure to recognize the enemy, or at least a failure to recognize the enemy's plan, the enemy's strategy. The Bible says, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Now the serpent here is understood as a manifestation of Satan. Now Satan is a word that comes from a Hebrew word that means adversary or enemy. Scholars point all the way to the end of the Bible, Revelation 12, 9, to uh, suggest and anchor that Satan here uh, is the serpent in the garden. Because in Revelation 12, 9, we read, And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Now, throughout the Bible, Satan is referred to with many names. He is the adversary, the enemy, the deceiver, the destroyer, the evil one, the liar, and the father of lies, and many other names. The word crafty here is very interesting. It's a Hebrew word that can be translated as subtle or even prudent. One might say sneaky or manipulative. Many scholars also believe the word carries a sense of sharp intelligence and maybe even beauty. So therefore, by implication, Adam simply did not recognize the approach of his mortal spiritual enemy. And I think Satan still largely flies underneath the radar in our modern world. Let me give you a brief theology of Satan. Now, that's a kind of an oxymoron if you think about it, but a theology of Satan. Satan was originally a heavenly being, according to the Bible, a powerful and beautiful angel, but became proud, sought to elevate himself above God, and so was cast out of heaven along with a host of others who followed him. We see uh, echoes of this in Isaiah 14, 12, where the Bible says, how you have fallen from heaven, morning star, or Lucifer, son of the dawn, you have been cast down, you said in your heart, I will ascend, I will raise my throne above the stars of God. So theologians believe that that all happened before Genesis 1-1. So Satan is a created being. Satan is not eternal. Satan is not omnipotent. Satan is limited in power and influence, but still is what the New Testament calls the prince of the power of the air. Uh, Perhaps the greatest place in the Bible we can see and understand how Satan operates and what his scope of authority is, is in the ancient book of Job, one of the oldest books of the Bible, one of the most challenging books of the Bible. Satan there is presented as um, one who challenges God for the soul of a man named Job. Satan basically says to God, Job only worships and serves you because you pay him to do so. Let me take away his material goods he'll curse you to your face. Let me take away his possessions, his family, he'll curse you to your face. Let me bring suffering on his body, he will curse you to your face. So God allows Satan limited authority to attack Job. Limited authority, but still he gives him authority and Satan does 
attack Job. Job never curses God. and the end of the story, God redeems everything that Job lost. But there's a picture in there of how Satan operates and who Satan is. Satan is set against God. Satan is the author of death. He's the author of all evil. He seeks to twist and destroy all God made as good. Now, the Bible presents God as sovereign. That is, God allows for Satan to... Uh, to do limited evil, but for his own, for God's own great eternal purposes. And well, that's a much greater discussion we'll talk about uh, at some point. Uh, so this adversarial relationship began, started before we pick up the story of the Bible, started pre-Genesis 1-1, but it does end in the book of Revelation. The only question is how long will God wait before he destroys his ultimate enemy forever? That's the only question. We're living in that time right now between. Notice, Satan does not approach wearing a red suit with horns and carrying a pitchfork. That's one of the great misunderstandings in our culture today. We trivialize evil. We trivialize Satan. Satan comes rather in the form of beauty, wealth, status, knowledge, and pleasure. In Nikos Kazantzakis' novel called The Last Temptation of Christ, you might remember the movie from 20 years or so ago, a couple of very good scenes, most of it was a waste of time. But he builds the whole novel. The novel is actually quite good. He builds the whole novel around one phrase in Luke's gospel where Luke writes, when the devil had finished all his tempting, when Jesus was in, was in the wilderness, when the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Now, neither Luke nor the other gospels ever come back uh, and tell us what that more opportune time was, if it even came. So Kazantzakis, as a novel writer, imagines that the best time for Satan to tempt Jesus would have been as he was on the cross. And what would have been right after he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So in the book and in the movie, uh, Satan is pictured coming to Jesus right at that moment. But he comes to Jesus in the form of a beautiful little girl with curls on her head. And she says, the father says he's very pleased with you. You don't have to die. You can come down now. And she holds out her hand to, to, to take Jesus off the cross. Now, the movie got a lot of things wrong, but got Satan right. Satan comes to Adam and Eve in the form of the serpent, beautiful and intelligent, and he engages their minds with a set of questions. What could be so bad about that? Secondly, we see failure to recognize the lie. Failure to recognize the lie. Now, here's a fun spectator sport. I've done this occasionally at home. Uh, I know others have as well. The game is try to spot the lie in TV commercials or in advertising. All right, let's start with a couple. An alert team guy sent me this one. If you, you can't quite see that. This is an ad in the magazine. It says, thou shalt covet. Thou shalt covet. It's an ad for Cadillac could hardly be more blatant, a direct contradiction to the 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet. And we can totally miss this in our culture. How about this one? This comes from earlier in the, the 19th century. Dr. Batty's For Your Health Asthma Cigarettes. <laughs> and the, the small print there you maybe can't see is, for the temporary relief of the paroxysms of asthma. Uh, uh, effectively treats asthma, hay fever, foul breath, all diseases of the throat, head colds, canker sores, and bronchial irritations. Not recommended for children under six, it says. <laughs> it could be, could be an ad that suggests that men don't really love their children unless they buy a particular car tire. Pay attention, you've seen that ad. Or women who lack self-esteem if they don't buy expensive forms of shampoo or the products that make their eyelashes thicker and longer. You ever see those things? Our culture does weird things to women, okay? Or that teens can be revolutionary by just watching music videos. Or that the average Joe is sexy if he drinks the right beer. Sorry, guys, you, you, you just aren't. Uh, the most common statistic says that the average home in America has the television on 24 to 30 hours each week. Some surveys indicate that teenagers are in front of a screen up to 50 hours a week in our culture. That's a lot of commercials. That's a lot of craftiness that they're being exposed to. The question is, do we teach them to recognize the lies? Back again to the story in Genesis. He, the servant, said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? You see the lie? You recognize it? What did God say? You can eat from any tree in the garden except that one. 
So Satan has subtly twisted God's word, and you can almost miss the lie altogether. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. And the woman said to the servant, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. So she got that part right. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it. She's already confused. God never said you can't touch it. He said, don't eat the fruit lest you die. Now notice, the serpent starts by questioning God. Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Very subtle. Amounts to twisting God's word into a lie. For God never said, don't eat from any tree in the garden. By merely phrasing the question this way, Satan paints God as a miserly figure. He's withholding goodness from the man and the woman, don't you see? And by the way, most sin is rooted in a mistrust of God's goodness. You're withholding something good from me, God. Therefore, I need to go get it my way. I need to get it this way. I need to get it prematurely. Most sin is a shortcut to God's goodness. What he's already going to give us, but he's going to give it to us in his way, in his timing. Then comes the lie. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So... When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. The question sets up the lie. You won't die. The lie is quickly followed by another. You will be like God. Basically a counterfeit promise. Think of it this way. Satan doesn't approach a teenager. Say, hey, drink this, smoke this, Shoot this into your veins and you'll ruin your life. That's not what he says. He says, hey, do this and you'll be cool. You'll have more friends. You'll have more fun. You'll have life with a capital L. That's what he says. Satan doesn't come to a married man and say, hey, see the hot blonde over there? I bet you could get in the sack with her and ruin your family. (laughs) He doesn't say that. What he says is, hey, do you believe in God? Do you believe God loves you? Because he loves you, don't you believe he wants you to be happy? I think she could make you happy. What do you think? That's the way he does it. See, the woman saw the tree was good for food. It was a delight to the eyes, looked so good, and desirable for gaining wisdom. I mean, how can gaining wisdom be a bad thing? God said, this tree will kill you. You will forfeit your life. Satan says, no, 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 no. He didn't really mean that. He meant the fruit of this tree will taste amazing and will make you healthier and smarter. This tree will give you life to see the adversarial relationship. First, we have failure to recognize the enemy. Then we have failure to recognize the lie. And thirdly, we have failure to engage. Failure to engage. Most of you, many of you know a little bit of Civil War history, but uh, President Lincoln for a time had a general named George McClellan. McClellan was a bright and capable leader who looked every bit the general when you read the historical reports. Loved to pose and put the finger in the, you know, the coat and all that sort of stuff. Um, but he had a tendency to be reluctant to engage in actual battle. He consistently overestimated the forces on the Confederate side. He constantly asked for reinforcements before he headed into battle. He wanted more troops before he could decide to engage the enemy. And on several occasions, he failed to attack with the full force of his forces, despite having a numerical advantage. And finally, uh, in 1862, he failed to decisively defeat Robert E. Lee's Confederate army at the Battle of Antietam. And it just finally was the last straw. And Lincoln got frustrated, and he fired him because he, would fa- he failed to fully engage the enemy. He looked like a warrior, but he consistently failed to engage. Look what happens here. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Here we see the key to the whole story. The key to this whole first three chapters is in four words. Do you pick them out? Who was with her? Who was with her? Who did the serpent approach? Eve. Who takes the fall for eating the forbidden fruit? Eve. Who takes the fall for being duped by the serpent, for falling to the lie? Eve. But who did God give the command to? Adam. Adam in chapters 1 and 2. Who did God give the woman to, to protect? Adam. 
Where was Adam while Eve was dealing with the serpent? Where was Adam when the serpent was lying to Eve about God? Where was Adam when the serpent was lying to Eve about the tree and the fruit? Where was Adam when the uh, serpent was lying to Eve about life and death? Adam was standing right there. He did nothing. This is what scholars call the sin of passivity. The sin of doing nothing. The sin of watching it happen. The sin of standing to the side. The sin of not protecting, not fighting, not being the warrior he was created to be. So how do we fail to engage today? I think we fail to engage uh, when we fail to recognize the enemy and his approach to our own lives and our own hearts. A lot of you who have been around team a long time know the way I say this is if you try to imagine, um, you know yourselves pretty well. Most of us know ourselves at least reasonably well. Uh, if you were Satan, how would you tempt you? When you answer that question, you know how he approaches you. Failure to engage is failing to notice how the enemy is approaching us as individuals in whatever role we have. Secondly, it's when we fail to defend and protect our families we fail to defend and protect our wives and fail to defend and protect our children from the approach of the enemy, from the lies that come their way. And when we fail to speak God's word into their lives, fail to speak God's truth into their lives, fail to model God's truth before their eyes, is when we fail to engage. Now, none of us are Billy Graham. We don't have to be a Billy Graham. We don't have to be a preacher. You just have to be able to model, have to be willing to model one who is engaged, one who recognizes the enemy, one who's willing to engage, one who's willing to speak the truth. Here's the questions I want you to deal with around the table tonight or today. Um, first, and I'm going to expand a couple of these so table leaders keep your pencils out. First, who was the spiritual leader of your family when you were growing up? Was there a spiritual leader? Describe how you knew who the spiritual leader of your family was. Maybe you didn't have one. That's fine. Talk about that. The follow-up question is, is there a dimension of spiritual leadership that you feel like you could grow in at this point in your life? What dimension of spiritual leadership would you like to grow in? Prayer, prayer for your family, prayer with your children, prayer for your wife, prayer with your wife, prayer for yourself, whatever it is. Uh, getting your family to, to, into a worship situation, if you haven't done that yet. How could you grow? So who was the spiritual leader growing up? What did you see? What, did you, what was modeled for you? How did you know? And then what would you like to do? And secondly, the serpent strategy was to confuse and to twist. I ask here, how is Satan still confusing and twisting today? Now, there's a couple ways you can go at answering that. First is, is you could just talk around the table, list, find, try to list three to five areas of life in our culture, just areas of life where Satan's lies are now considered truth. How is he twisting truth today? Three to five areas where, where Satan's lies are now considered standard operating procedure in our culture. See if you can find them. Or use your, your phone and find two or three campaigns, ad campaigns, like the ones I put up here today. They're all over the place. And some of the lies are very, very subtle. And if you're in advertising, I apologize, I get it. They're not all lies, but some of them are. <laughs> Mixing values. Do this, get that. Do this, get that. And there's a lot of spiritual values thrown around in advertising. See if you can find a couple of those. That'll be fun. So have some, have, take some time around the table, get some coffee, get some donuts. You got a little more time to talk today. I'll wrap you up right before 7 o'clock.